Well, we're going to go ahead and get started today. My name is Joel Hoff. I'm the Director of Research, uh, Education, and Consulting for Unique Venues. Uh, we have a couple individuals that are here with us today. Uh, one is Chuck Salem, who is the CEO of Unique Venues, and then Scott Fish uh, from 32 Degrees Digital. And I'm going to let Scott do his introduction when he gets started on his presentation. But I want to do a couple of housekeeping notes really quickly first. Um, just a reminder to everyone that you are all on mute uh, throughout the webinar, so you don't need to worry about that. But that means you will need to use the Q&A dialog box to su uh, submit questions. Uh, once questions are submitted, you'll see the Q&A button flash. Uh, you can open that window and keep an eye on it throughout. There's where you can submit a question, or you can upvote or downvote a question. Uh, some of them Chuck and I will respond to just via typing. Others uh, Scott will respond to live in the webinar presentation today. We will also run a few polls during the webinar today. You can see what those polls are just to kind of get the pulse on how people are, are using social media right now. Uh, and I will kick those off. I, I won't interrupt Scott to do so, so keep an eye on the chat box as well. And then I'll try to remind people that the polls are live. You'll see your poll button flash orange when a poll is launched and available out there. And finally, as people are already doing, if you've got comments to share or you wanna ask a larger question of the group, Feel free to do that in the chat box. Uh, again, it helps sometimes to have two or three pop them out and have them open and you can keep an eye on things that are going on. But the more you put in to the engagement for the webinar today, the more that you'll likely take away from this session. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Scott Fish to do his introduction and we'll get started. Okay, hello everyone, good morning. And uh, good afternoon to the East Coasters. Appreciate everyone joining us. Um, hopefully everyone can see my presentation screen here. Um, as Joel mentioned, uh, my name is Scott Fish. I live in the Portland, Oregon area, Vancouver specifically. Um, many of us are locked down just like a lot of you are. Um, so I hope everyone's been getting a little bit of exercise out there and being able to continue work in, you know, in a safe and uh, healthy environment. So. Um, anyways, I, I know some of you that I've seen pop in as attendees. Um, I recognize some folks that I've talked to, so it's great to see some familiar faces. Um, I've been working with Chuck and the Unique Venues team for, we were just talking about that, about 12 years now. Um, and uh, I've seen a lot of changes in the, the tourism and hospitality and event space um, over those years in digital marketing and also some of the trends, you know, in the industry. So um, today I would like to spend some time talking about the social undistancing that we're all feeling and experiencing right now um, and talk about how we can actually use that kind of the power of social media um, to get connected with people during this time of some so, uh, heightened social media activity and, and hopefully help develop some relationships for you um, and develop some content development opportunities and that kind of thing. So we are going to get started. Um, there's a little bio about me, but I'll skip through that because you just heard that. So we all wish you were here. We all wanna be outside doing things, uh, being at events. Um, a lot of you, I noticed there were some retreat centers. You know, These are the, the folks that you want uh, attending your events. Unfortunately, you know, events are not happening. Um, and so this is a good time to shore up some of the, the strategies that you have on the digital media, digital marketing side. Um, and connect with the right people. So we're gonna talk about that. So some, some of the changes right now that we're seeing in social media um, are happening right before our eyes. You know, one of the things about social is that it's very addictive. So a lot of us have a lot more time on our hands. We're working from home. Um, so the, the usage of social media has skyrocketed. Obviously people are connecting with family, friends, but they're also using it more and more you know, in a business setting. Um, you know, Facebook in particular, WhatsApp has seen a huge boost in usage over the time and especially the messaging features we're seeing a lot of facebook owned properties which includes facebook instagram and whatsapp uh, about 70 percent increase in messaging usage so people are having conversations on social some of it's behind the scenes some of it's public um, so we'll talk about some of the opportunities to to partake in that from a business perspective and then quality versus quantity um, something i've learned in the years of working in digital is that Social media doesn't necessarily, you know, have its value in how many followers you have, how many people are necessarily attached to an account. Sometimes some of the more influential people are actually the ones that are, are following less people uh, and, and they're, they're following the right people. So that's just something to keep in mind as you're 
navigating through this is that um, sometimes the quality is is more important than the quality. The co the um, quality is more important than uh, quantity. So what are some of the companies doing right now uh, with social media and online? I think this is, I want to bring this up to you all because this is pretty important. Uh, Google has actually, they temporarily closed the ability for people to mark a business as, as closed permanently because so many people were going out and saying that a business is closed, even though it's really not, it's just temporarily closed. So there's been some abilities now for marketers to go in and, and mark a company as having special hours or temporarily closed. And the, the guidance on this is that if you go into your Google local business, you'll be able to say that you are temporarily closed if it's more than two weeks that you anticipate being closed. So a lot of venues are obviously closed because they're, they're under you know, county or state orders that they can't operate. So um, this is one way to deal with that. Yelp has also come out with a way to temporarily close and Bing uh, local business has as well. So that's not necessarily social media, but it all impacts almost all everyone on this call. Um, a little bit more on the SEO and uh, side of things, but uh, I think it's important to shore up some of that right now. Um, so people do understand if you are closed or if you're temporarily closed or if you're taking, you know, orders um, outside of, you know, being available for the public. I found a way to get Fred Rogers into this. He has a saying that in a time of crisis, um, look for the helpers. And I think this is really relevant to us today. Um, you know, a lot of people are looking for how they can do more right now uh, with the time that they have at home. And specifically in social media, finding those helpers is, is critical. Um, that's how you can amplify what you're doing on social media. So today we're going to talk about um, the different ways that you can find those helpers. And the first thing is let's listen. Um, you know, social media tools exist out there that can help you listen in on what people are talking about and find some opportunities. One, one of my favorite tools is a tool called Haro which is Help a Reporter Out by Cision, which is a very large PR uh, uh, tool to find reporters and, and publications and, and writers. It's free for you to sign up and you can actually be a source. So off to the right here, you can see um, actual uh, emails that I've received uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, specifically about events that are changing because of the coronavirus um, and also you know, a micro wedding trend. So if you are a venue that um, can hold a small venue, a small event or small wedding, uh, you could respond to this person um, and, and give them pictures or examples of some of the micro weddings that people are holding at your, at your venue. So these are some great ways to get in front of content writers and a lot of the uh, emails that you receive from Haro, you, you'll actually get about a hundred or so uh, potential opportunities in each one and there's about one to three emails each day. So it's about 300 opportunities to get in front of somebody. And you, you do see big publications like Forbes and Wedding Wire, um, and I've seen a lot of other you know, New York Times, uh, AP uh, folks that are actually requesting story ideas. So sometimes you already have the content created, sometimes you may need to create it on the fly uh, and send it out to them. But this is a great way to get in front of the right uh, editors and writers uh, for some bigger publications. And it's something you can do right now while we're all working from home. Another tool for listening um, is Brand24. This tool is a great tool to kind of help you prioritize communication. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about using social media for uh, managing customer service on the next slide, but this tool will help you a little bit with that because it'll actually show you if people are talking about your brand or if they're talking about a topic and what the sentiment actually is. So during this time, we have a lot of people talking about events and things going on. Um, and so this is a great tool to help you collect that information and find out who you should be having conversations with. Um, and so again, this is a listening tool and it helps you prioritize uh, who you should talk to and, and how important they are from a influential uh, perspective. Another tool I really like here um, and the strategy around it is Social Bakers. So uh, on the listening side, Social Bakers is a tool that allows you to build out some rules around topics that you wanna follow. And you can follow and drill down to specific uh, categories, sub subcategories, and also location information. So 
you could actually build out a listening campaign specific to social events or business events or both and have this information basically be fed to you as people are having conversations out there. And this just identifies people that are, you know, talking about topics that you may be blogging about already or something that you may be putting out on social media already. Um, and you could contact them and say, hey, we just wrote a blog post about this or we have a social media post going out this week about this. I'd love to get your perspective on this. And, and hopefully they will also share it uh, as an influencer. So it's a great way to connect with those kind of people. All right, so if you tuned into uh, one of our previous uh, seminars, we talked about uh, using social media as a customer service nurturing tool. So um, this is a reused slide, but I think it's really useful in this case because you do have a lot of people reaching out to your venue, uh, finding out if you're open, finding out if you're taking, um, taking bookings into the future. How far out are you taking bookings? So um, you know, if you ignore some of the customers on social media, they're, they're very likely to go to a competitor and, and uh, they're not very likely to recommend you to a friend. So we do find uh, that a lot of people spend more money when they have a great brand experience. And if that brand experience starts with a social media connection or conversation, then that's, that's an important first connection. Um, in digital media, digital marketing, we find that a lot of times it takes multiple connections for somebody to actually convert. Uh, they may come in through their website, they may then click a Google ad, they then may engage with you on social media, maybe they sign up for a newsletter, and a few weeks later they actually convert into a customer. So, you know, this is just one milestone in their pathway of connecting with you, um, whether they're a current customer or a, or a potential future customer. So we just talked about listening, so now let's talk about connecting. Um, you know, I think one of the important things to do right now is to connect with people, build up some of those opportunities. Uh, you may not necessarily find that you're getting a lot of, of sales or, or, or lead uh, that follow through to a conversion just because there's some, you know, un, unknown in terms of timing of, of when an event could, could actually be held. Um, so now is a great time to build up content, build up those connections with people. Um, and uh, start to build that audience. So before I get too far into this, Joel, I see that we have some poll results. Do you, do you have uh, some information you'd like to share with the group? Sure, we can uh, really quickly just highlight for those people that may be listening in um, that uh, right now we've got a great representation across the industry right now. Uh, about two thirds of the people participating are Unique Venues members, but we've got a good amount of non-member venues and planners, uh, even a couple industry representatives and then someone from the media out there and uh, the general public. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, looks like most people are in the States, but uh, we have someone in the UK and, and a few in Canada. And it looks like similar to what we know is almost everyone today is working from home. Few people still go into the office occasionally and a couple of people that have to go in daily probably uh, I'd imagine as essential personnel. So, but we have no active questions at this time, so you can keep right on rolling. All right, thank you, thank you. So I'm glad to see that we have some, some planners uh, and industry representatives attending. So, you know, just to highlight what we're talking about here, you're on the receiving side of a lot of this. So, you know, if you are a planner and, and a non-venue kind of stakeholder, um, this is an opportunity for you to find these opportunities to connect with potential uh, unique venue members or, other uh, event, event spaces out there that uh, maybe are, you aren't on their radar quite yet. So um, one of the tools I like in terms of connecting with audiences is a tool called Ninja Outreach. Um, it's kind of a smaller social media tool, um, but it's, it's really built out a lot in the last few years. Um, it's a tool that basically allows you to bring in information about uh, influencers based on their location and the topics that they talk about. Um, and, uh, and pull in the information from Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, uh, all in one place, and then actually send out a group email to those folks, and you can build out templated emails. So for instance, if I was a venue uh, in Portland, and I wanted to reach out to wedding photographers and wedding planners or event planners, I could build out a list for each of those and then send out a, a message to them. You can actually send it out as a direct message through the platforms or you can send it out as an email. Uh, either way, you can export that information and start connecting with those people in, in various ways. 
um, and start building up relationships with them. So it's kind of an under the radar tool. Um, and we've seen uh, that we have about a 46% response rate, uh, initial response rate with this tool. So about half of the people that we contact actually either come back and say, I'm not interested or I am interested or, you know, um, here's, here's how you can get in touch with me on another channel. Um, and then from that group, we see about 23% success rate in getting some type of content or sharing uh, going out. And of course, that's what it's all about is, you know, you want them to connect and share with you and engage with your brand. All right, so, you know, what if you could place some content on websites uh, that, you know, for instance, your blog posts or social media posts, and then get that in front of uh, writers or uh, journalists uh, around the country um, and have them see that information. So right now is a really good time to uh, consider spending a little bit of money actually in Facebook or Twitter um, and target journalists, uh, people who are writing articles. There's, you know, as we saw with Haro, there are a lot of people writing articles about the event business right now. And you can actually run an ad on Facebook targeting people that live in a certain area um, that have certain jobs titles or job interests um, and they could be uh, journalists or editors or writers. Um, and this is a great way to run an ad for any of your social media posts that you want to get a little more attention around and show it to these people. Um, that obviously will drive some traffic to your site. It'll also help you connect with some people that you maybe don't even have on your radar yet. Um, we're in a very um, decentralized world in terms of content creation. And so, you know, some of the people writing this content for a certain publication, uh, and let's say a New England publication, they may actually live in California or they may live in Florida. So you may just not ever have someone on your radar and this is a good way to find who those people are. All right, so continuing about connecting to the audience. So, um, you know, we are actively reaching out right now to photographers and people in the event space, uh, utilizing some of the the hashtag uh, tagging capabilities on uh, places like Instagram and, and other channels because this is a great way to pull in some of that curated content opportunities that you may not have on your radar yet. So just using some simple hashtags, you know, we see Virginia photography. If I'm, if I'm a venue in Virginia and I want to uh, connect with photographers, this is a great way to go through and find some of those people start interacting with them, start building up those relationships with people. Um, a really simple way to manage this is to use a Google Sheet and start tracking who you've connected with uh, and the websites that they have and um, how you've reached out to them and, and what kind of response rate you're getting. Um, there are so many different ways to slice and dice uh, posts on social media and people. Um, and so finding that, that right mixture for you, I think will help you get connected with the right people in a, in a more, organized way. It can be a little daunting to think, oh my goodness, we have a hundred photographers in our area, or we have, you know, a thousand potential planners that we want to reach in this larger region. You don't have to reach them all to have a big success. You really just need to get in, find a system that works for you, and build out uh, a strategy to, to reach out to those people and make sure that you're providing them with something that's valuable that their readers or their followers are going to, to find valuable. So, Again, it all goes back to that quality content piece, whether it's a blog post or a social media post. Um, you know, having that quality piece ready to go and share with folks and listen to that, how it's resonating with them um, will help you be more successful using this strategy. Hey, Scott, we had a, a quick question before you get too far down the road about yes. the, the Ninja Outreach platform. Uh, do you normally reach out on Ninja Outreach via the platform itself or via email? How does that work? So you can do it both ways. Um, Ninja Outreach in the tool itself allows you to, to create templated emails that can go out to people. Um, you can also create templated direct messages to go out to those people in those native channels. Uh, you also can, the other way would be to export out the data. Um, and so anybody who has an email address associated with their Instagram account, for instance, you'll get that email address and you could send them a message through your Gmail for instance. Um, so there's, there's two ways to do it. Um, the higher success tends to be messaging people directly in a native platform rather than sending them an email. Although, you know, if you have their email address, that's a great secondary follow-up. Um, and that's how we've actually gotten some of the good success rates 
is uh, send him an initial native message within the platform and then doing a secondary email follow-up. Great, and someone just asked, is this similar to Constant Contact? Um, I believe Constant Contact has some tools around social media, so does Hootsuite and, and uh, MailChimp even, um, but it's different because it, it, it pulls in um, data from multiple channels and Instagram has historically been hard to get good data around. They've kind of locked down some of their ability for companies to pull out data that's valuable in terms of influencer data. So um, this is one of the tools that actually brings in Instagram data correctly and gives you a pretty good view on um, kind of the active follower counts and uh, engagement and that kind of thing. So. And then one last question that's come in yeah. on this topic. I think uh, someone's asking, do, are you suggesting to reach out to these other vendors in order to share content or establish relationships or what's the real focus on yeah. um, using a Ninja outreach? Yeah, so all the above. Um, if you have some content that, that you think would be valuable for somebody to uh, write a post about or blog about, then reaching out to them directly makes a lot of sense. If you wanna put together a strategy, um, for instance, talking about, you know, the best wedding trends that are happening, you know, in this area um, or for 2020, then reaching out to wedding planners and getting their buy-in and their, their, their story of some trends, that would create a great blog post and it would also let you connect with them. Theoretically, if you had 10 wedding planners that contributed to a piece of content that you're creating, they're going to also then go out and share it to their followers as well. So you're amplifying, you're taking one piece of content, you're getting out across 10 uh, other social media accounts and then also your own. Um, and so the, the, the exponential reach that you have um, is quite large from that. And to be honest, you know, some of those wedding planners may not have you on your, their radar as an event venue. Um, so you've just built up a nice personal relationship with them. And, I, and to be honest, I think that's, that's probably more valuable from a business driving, you know, activity than, you know, getting a link or getting a, getting a tweet, <laughs> you know, how much is a tweet worth? It's, it's worth nothing if it doesn't drive any business. So, um, you know, building up those personal relationships through social media, through digital marketing, um, at the end of the day, that's where you see the real value. Great. Thanks, Scott. I think you can jump back to where you were. Okay. Thank you. All right. So let's talk about leading. Um, so some different ways that we can lead in some of the conversation. Um, you know, right now is a, is a great time to be the creator of content. Um, there's a lot of people that are looking for information. There's a lot of people that are at home. Maybe they have a little extra time in their work day to do some hunting around and, and reading about trends and things going on uh, in the event space. So now's a great time to lead and, and even start the conversation with people. Um, one of the tools that I love to use is a, is a tool called Answer the Public. It's been around a little while, it's, it's a little funky, um, but basically what they do is you can take a keyword like event venues, I did here, and it will create a, a list of kind of permutations based on search volume data uh, that people are actually looking for. So you can see here in this little wheel graphic, we have things like how, what, why, who, which, all of those then have branches that come off um, and people are searching for, you know, which venue can hold a, a uh, wedding the size of 200 people, or where is a um, university that could hold a 100 person business event? You know, all those long tail searches are things that you would discover using this tool. Um, I also then can pull out some of that actual core data into like a spreadsheet. So I, I pulled out some of that just for planning a wedding, very, you know, common topic that people search for quite a bit. So, you know, you can see here just how how people are searching for that. You know, they're looking for how do you start? Where do you begin? How long does it take? How stressful is planning a wedding? Probably quite stressful. Um, you know, how do you survive wedding, planning a wedding? So these are all topics that you could roll up into a blog post um, and even have a little fun with it. How to survive a stressful, you know, wedding planning. I mean, that would be a great social media blog, uh, social media post uh, title or topic to use. So you can get some ideas here um, to build out some of that content and, and spend the time over these next month or two or three uh, kind of building up your cache of content, which then you can use on social media as a shareable content. Pinterest, our favorite. Um, you know, Pinterest is obviously used by a lot of event planners. Uh, a lot of event uh, spaces are using Pinterest. So 
you know, my, my big takeaway here would be that now's a great time to start creating some content that you could use on your Pinterest account. I pulled in some screenshots of some pins that I thought were really relevant. You know, the first one being apps that wedding planners can use. That's a really easy uh, blog post to put together and a really easy Pinterest and Instagram and LinkedIn and Twitter, you know, post to put together. Let's just go out and find some great apps that people might be interested in uh, using and then take it a step further. Let's email those, you know, the marketing director for those apps and say, Hey, you know, I just want to let you know, we highlighted you guys on a blog post here. Um, we also just shared this on our social media accounts. We'd love, you know, for you to give us a little extra love if you can. Um, and, uh, in doing that, you'll, you may be surprised. You may find that some of the big event app planning tools that are out there have websites and social media accounts, and they actually share your blog post highlighting them which helps you with some links and it also helps you with some social media posts. So I think that's a really important strategy to use. Also, you know, downloadable content, um, a printable, you know, planner or something that somebody can take and, and start that, that process with, you know, put your logo on it, put your name on it. Um, you know, that gets circulated around, you know, with people, um, if they find it extremely valuable and they're planning an event, they may print it off or share that with a friend who's planning another event. And, you know, if you can be the, the originator of that content, um, who knows how many iterations will come out of that, that opportunity. And, you know, it's pretty easy to put that kind of stuff together. Um, and if you put it together, it's a blog post, it's a social post, it's a downloadable graphic, it could be included in your newsletter. There's a lot of ways to take one piece of content and, and use it across multiple channels. So I see we have some more, uh, poll information. So Joel, uh, would you like to share uh, which social media platforms people are using for businesses? Would love to. Um, we've got uh, a great uh, number of people using the, the big ones, Facebook and Instagram, uh, with about a half our people using LinkedIn and Twitter and a few using Pinterest. Uh, so again, the Pinterest slide here is very timely to help people think through how you could use something like that from a business perspective. Um, and it seems like I'm interested by this, but for a lot of people, not only are they registered with those platforms, but they're actually actively using them. The numbers are not too different between who's registered and who's active. So a few people out there have acknowledged that they're, they're signed up, but maybe they're not as active on them as they could be. But it looks like people who are signed up are actually using them, which is fantastic. Um, the people think that the social media platform that gives them the best return on brand awareness and engagement would be Facebook and Instagram, uh, with just a little bit on the others. And uh, people think that uh, Facebook and Instagram do the same thing for lead generation, event registrations, or revenue generation. A little bit from LinkedIn, almost nothing from Pinterest and Twitter. So again, kind of to your point, some of these strategies are about making people aware of you, whereas some of these strategies are about driving people to submit business leads and, and other uh, revenue generating activities to your, uh, to your business. And we do have a quick question that kind of ties into this as well. I think someone asked, I, they'd be interested in what you think about a business that doesn't have a social media presence right now, starting up with social media presence during this weird time. I think it's a great time to invest. Um, you know, obviously you don't want your first social media post to be all about COVID-19, <laughs> you know? So I, in a sense, you can kind of, uh, build out your cache of information and, and posts and graphics that you want to build out and be ready to go. If you want to wait a few weeks, you could. Um, but you know, any business that doesn't have social media is obviously missing out on a, a channel there, uh, a third party engagement. Um, and so I think, you know, if you don't have a social media presence right now, um, look at where your potential clients are going to be and pick one or two channels and go all in with those. I think we, we live in a time where there's so much social media channel opportunities out there that sometimes it's a little overwhelming. Um, you know, Twitter gets used a lot. I see from, from our, pool, our poll, about 44% of people are using Twitter, but only 5% actually see a, a good return on investment in terms of their time and, and, and energy being spent on Twitter. Chuck, you have a comment. Yeah, and I think to just to go along with that question is that I, I don't know why some people. I mean, I, there's a, there were a number of people who don't in that pool have any kind of active active social media right now, and there's all kinds of reasons why that may be. Um, some may be limited staff resources. Some may be you know we've been talking about your A pal, B pal, C pal. Your A power, the things that 
are like putting out fires and your B power, things with immediate deadlines that you have to attend to, and the C power, those things that you hope to get to when you can. And now's probably one of those times that you can focus on your C pile. Um, and Scott, and I'm sorry if I'm uh, if I if you said something and I might have missed it because I'm thinking about all kinds of things and reading comments. But you know, <clears throat> can you build on that and say if you were going to do it, what should you focus on? What one or two? If somebody's getting started, what's what's the best focus for them right now? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that's a good point. Your ABC pile. Um, you know, I would probably put on my A pile to create an account on Facebook. Uh, Instagram is probably your secondary one, you know, at this point, um, just because of the breadth that, that you have and the reach. Um, there's also some non-social media reasons to be on in Facebook, for instance. You know, Facebook gives you good links uh, from an SEO standpoint. There's, there's value there. Um, there are groups you can join. Uh, there are all kinds of ways, you know, to engage with uh, Facebook users. So I, I would say, you know, if I were going from zero to hero, I would spend, you know, the next week thinking about how, how my potential customers are going to engage with me and how I want to engage with them. Um, you know, I, I've talked about this on previous uh, webinars that, you know, deciding how much involvement you want to have in your own social media presence is, is a really important thing. You know, are you going to sit down and write blog posts and Facebook posts, you know, on a regular basis? Or is that something that someone in your organization can do or another company can do? you know, with your guidance. So, um, you know, that's the first thing to answer is what kind of content and how involvement am I going to be in the social media? So um, mm -hmm. just be real with yourself around that. And, you know, I'm a big believer that if, if I'm not passionate about doing something and I'm not, or I'm not good at it, that's an area to bring in an expert or someone within your company that's living and breathing some of that content already and let them be the ones that are putting up posts and photos and that kind of thing because they're in it, they're living it at that, at your event space. Um, and so sometimes, you know, just like we see sometimes, um, you know, within a coffee shop, for instance, sometimes the baristas are the best ones to have post about social media information, events, photos, that kind of thing, because they're interacting with customers. They, they really are the brand. Um, so who in your organization exemplifies the brand? Those are the people that you want to bubble up to the top uh, with so, some of your social media posts. And uh, Scott, uh, you may be coming to this later in the presentation. If so, we can hold it till then. But a question came in as to how do you track ROI on social media? Yeah, so good question. Um, you know, realize that social media has a couple different ways to track ROI. One would be the direct way. Uh, if I'm running a Facebook ad or an Instagram ad or a LinkedIn ad, I can tie back a, an exact cost per click and, and ad spend for, per month and see how many leads I'm getting. So that, that's, a, that's a very ROI focused way to look at it. The non-exact non way is to just understand, are we seeing a lift? You know, are we seeing a lift in brand searches in Google? Are we seeing a lift in people sharing our content? You know, a share on Facebook is worth a lot more than a comment on Twitter, for instance, or a, or a, a share on Twitter. So you can actually create a scorecard for yourself um, to figure out kind of a baseline of, of what your activity looks like now. Um, and if a, if a share on LinkedIn is worth five points and a share on Facebook is worth two and an Instagram follower that has over a hundred thousand followers that, you know, comes in is worth, you know, three points, then you can kind of multiply those out every month and see what you're affecting compared to your baseline from previous months. So it, it, it could be co as complex as you want it to be. It could be also be very simple and, and just say, you know, are we, are we seeing an increase in brand awareness? Are we seeing an increase in activity and interaction with, with our brand? Um, but ROI is tough, you know, with social media, especially the indirect ROI. Um, there's a lot of conversations happening right now at organizations around, you know, how do I show, you know, we've, we've hired a social media person, we've hired a content writer. And now how do we show the value that they're, that they're driving to the business? So if you are that person or you're in charge of that person at an organization, you know, you've got to find ways to empower them to see that value and share that value within, within your company. Um, if someone is interviewed in a blog post, you know, follow back up with them and say, Hey, we interviewed you last week or three months ago. And, and we've gotten a ton of activity on social media. We've had a ton of traffic on our website. Thank you for doing that. Um, and I'd love to get your, you know, get you involved more with our, 
our social media strategy because your voice, you know, is something that people are listening to. Um, and that, that doesn't have a direct ROI, but you can definitely, you know, argue that more traffic to the website and more interaction on social media is worth a lot. Thanks, Scott. So let's yep. go ahead and pick back up with your presentation and keep us on track to make sure we can get through it all. Sure, sounds good. All right, so talking a little bit more about leading our audiences. So um, a lot of you, if you're in digital marketing, you've probably heard of a tool called Moz. It used to be called SEO Moz. Uh, it's a company in Seattle that's been around for quite a long time, uh, a little bit more of an SEO tool, but there is some social media um, tools within their platform that you can use. Um, you know, one of the, the really simple ways to find some of the conversations or people that we want to build relationships with is to use uh, the Moz tool and actually do a, a SERP analysis. SERP stands for search engine result page. Um, I can take a keyword and, and drop it in and see what the top results are for a certain topic. And you can see here, we have some local business owners for photography that are showing up across the top. Those are all map listings. Those are people that if I got them to blog about me or got them to talk about me, Google's already saying that they're the top result organically. Um, so there's a really good chance that I'm going to get some traffic. I'm going to get some activity. There's some SEO value. There's some social value in, in having those people share my content. The, the next group on here is you have places like Yelp, Thumbtack, um, you know, these are obviously directory sites, uh, unique venues being a directory site, essentially, um, for a lot of venues, you know, there's great opportunities to leverage the social media that these other larger sites are doing uh, for your business. And in fact, they want you to contribute information as much as possible. So, you know, make Chuck's day and send him great stories of events that you're holding and photos of unique things that people are doing. Um, you know, the unique venues team obviously wants that information so they can put it out. And, you know, by doing that, they're highlighting your venue. They're also, you know, engaging with you in a different and, and meaningful way. So you will find that there's a lot of opportunities out there to engage with people. And, you know, by, by you going after some of the, the sites that are showing up high in Google search results, you're going to get traffic from that when they blog about you. You're going, you know, that's kind of a validator of, am I, am I doing this? you know, in a way that's going to be meaningful down the road. So I think that's just a really important strategy that I wanted to highlight for everybody. And Scott, if you don't mind, I want to just jump in because we're getting some questions where people are asking what SEO is. Ah. So um, I just want to make, I'm going to, let me try to put my Chuckified answer on it because I keep it at a really low understanding level because that's me. Um, search engine optimization to me is the art of being findable in search results, whether it's Google or Bing or whatever, when people type in what they're looking for and they conduct a search, you want to be on the first page of the search results. And your search engine optimization, the things that you do to your website, the things that you do to your landing page, help to make you findable in a really crowded marketplace. So I've read statistics, and Scott, maybe you have something here that would verify this, or maybe I'm wrong, but well over 80% of searchers don't go beyond the first page of organic search re uh, yeah. of the organic search results. So this is different than the paid ads you see at the top and the bottom of the search results pages. These are the ones in the middle. Um, that that's the organic. So that's my Chuckify definition of SEO. Yeah. No, I think I think that's a good example. You know, and and you know SEO historically has been a way that a lot of people are getting traffic to their site. Um, you know, if you look at your Google Analytics, you'll probably see about 60% of your traffic is coming through SEO, is coming through a, a search engine channel. You know whether it's Google or or um, or uh, Bing or Yahoo. Um, and so you, you do find that the SEO strategies also tie in with social media. You know a lot of the content that you're putting out there in order to get traffic organically if you can get the right people to share that, that's going to build up links. Other people will see that content. They may write a blog post about your content and include a link back to you. So it's very tied together. You know, if you look at SEO as the foundation and then social media is kind of the way to, you know, that's the presence and then the social media way is the promotion side of it. Um, you know, a lot of your content and social can tie together. And so my idea here that I wanted to share with everybody is, you know, there are ways to find out who are going to be valuable partners to share from an SEO standpoint and a social media standpoint. 
And in this case, we see with Moz that 94%, uh, there's a 94% click-through rate with organic listings here. So even if there's ads on the top, um, you know, in this Google search result, we do see that there's a, a pretty high click-through rate with organic, which is pretty awesome. So um, Moz costs about a hundred bucks a month. You can track keywords, you can look, use that to, to get information about links. You can look at search engine result pages. It's really, it's a really valuable tool to invest in um, just to understand more about, you know, what the search presence looks like for your, your business and then, and then use the social media channels to amplify that. Okay, so now you are here. Um, so we've gotten through to the end of the presentation. So I just wanted to give a few takeaways. So, you know, a couple of things uh, that we talked about today are, you know, shoring up your social media business channels with updated information. Going back to Google Local Business, uh, Yelp, Bing, you know, there are our, our tools now to say, say whether your business is closed or temporary closed or you have different hours. So um, take some time and, and get that done. Uh, Facebook also has some information about that as well. So um, look for the helpers. Uh, Fred Rogers says that, um, you know, I think that's really important right now. You, you have a lot of loyal people that follow your event venue spaces um, and they would love to share really inspirational content right now. So put together something that's going to, you know, resonate with folks in this time um, and, and have your helpers help promote your business. Um, you know, you see a lot of memes out there, right? So why not create some of your own memes related to your brand or related to your business location? Yes, Chuck. And one of the things I'd like to add is that for those of you who are members of unique venues, remember that you can make your social links, links to your social platforms, not ours, but yours live on your own profile on unique venues. So make sure you go into the member dashboard and add links to your Facebook page, Instagram pages, Twitter, whatever it may be, so that those will then be live on your profile. So that's great. And Allie, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, so it can, is there other ways that we can share their social content for them through our social outlets? Yeah, so we have a little ad running in our newsletters, um, and we should be sending that out here shortly within the next day, um, where we are trying to promote um, aesthetically pleasing images of our venues um, you know, from hosting great events that they've had at their spaces. And we try to share them, um, especially on our Instagram page for everybody. We feel like Instagram's a great platform to use that to show great images. Um, and we, of course, we link and tag your space in that um, post as well. Great, thank you. That's great. So get us well, some information and we'll get it out there for you through our platforms as well. So. You can, I, I'm just going to say, um, you can email it to social at uniquevenues.com if you're a member of Unique Venues. That's great. I'm really glad to hear how receptive, you know, everyone is to that because it, it really does help fuel the fire. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we all need content to promote and the Unique Venues, you know, uh, network of uh, venues is 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 really fired up. I think right now to get you know new business and get connected with people. I know Chuck's extremely fired up. I used to call him President on Fire, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know it, it, it's a really important time for the for the industry to share and be connected. And, and I think you know social media is a great way to be more cohesive around that. So, and uh, I, and I think what Ali's suggesting one of the most important things about that at this very time that we're in. In this unprecedented time is that what she's asking you for is an image that elicits some kind of an emotional response like oh my gosh that's beautiful oh my look at that great setup because those are the kind of things that kind of give people a boost in a time when they need one of those so they're inspiring so uh you know that's why it's great to get get those pictures out there those pictures that elicit that emotive response that people need and want right now in this time i mean it's a great way to use it so yeah that's great well let's talk a little bit about this time that we're in it looks like joel we have some some uh, poll information about how people are managing their social media ad spend uh, during the COVID crisis and what their plans are afterwards. Let's talk about that a little bit. You bet. So we, uh, we've got about half the people in the group that are not spending on social media ads. 
but of those that are, uh, only a few are increasing in spend right now, which makes sense. Uh, some are decreasing, but many are staying the same, which is showing that they're remaining present in the marketplace um, to, to kind of you know, make sure their awareness and, and their engagement stays up during this time. Um, after uh, COVID-19 starts to subside, uh, we see some people, about a third of the people that are planning to increase spend, which is great. I, I think, again, the idea is that uh, once this lets up, people are going to be ready to rebook and hold new events, and everyone's going to want to get out of the house and do this, and so people are going to want to let them know that they can come and be a part of what's going on there. Uh, and actually, what's exciting is that 12% of the people are saying they plan to start spending on advertising after this is done, even though they haven't done it before. Maybe that's an outcome of hearing about some stuff today, or maybe that's just realizing how many other members uh, and, and venues and places are doing it right now. And uh, finally, just some numbers on how much people typically spend. Uh, most people are in the lower ranges, which makes sense. You don't have to spend a ton on social media uh, in order to have an impact, and so it doesn't have to break the budget, but uh, it is a kind of a recurring expense that you have to go with. So, Scott, what do you, what do you think about those results? Yeah, you know, one of the interesting things is, is the knee-jerk reaction once everything started closing up was, oh my goodness, we should, we should pull all of our ad spend because no one can book. Well, a lot of people have done that. And so if you are a remaining advertiser, you are going to have a cheaper ad spend, you know, cost per click than what you've had in the past. So pulling it all doesn't necessarily make 100% sense. Um, dialing it back to maybe 20% or 25% right now could make sense. Um, keeping it maybe at 50% could make sense. But at the end of the day, if, if you're not seeing the return, even on that 25% of ad spend, you know, you should consider pausing it, you know, at least for a little while. Um, but we are in a time where people are spending less, you know, on Google ads, they're spending less on Facebook ads. So, you know, if you want to keep your feet in the water, um, you're going to get a little bit more or potentially a lot more exposure uh, per dollar than you had in the past. So I think that's, um, I think that's just something to consider, you know, particularly around your brand. Um, you know, we, we haven't talked a lot about Google ads, but keeping a brand campaign going on, if someone searches for your company's name or organization's name and they're interested in whether events are being canceled or rescheduled or how do I reschedule my event at this place, you know, then you can at least show up and, and be in front of those people with the right, the right content. So um, yeah, I think it, it's an interesting time. It, it kind of, it, I would say it's kind of an individual, you know, decision of how much you want to spend and, and uh, it was nice to see that actually that a lot of people are planning to spend more once these things subside, you know, deciding when to go back into that market and start spending is going to be different for everybody. You know, you're all in different cities and states and you have different rules. You know, we have our federal guidelines and things, but, you know, there are different places around the country that are allowing events and, and not. So, um, and there's some sensitivity around that topic as well, of course, right now. I, I just want to add to that too, that, you know, we've been beating the drum since this all started in mid-March. Um, and the drum we've been beating says, you know, don't hide under a rock because it says something to a consumer when you go away. Um, when you get, people are looking for confidence right now. They wanna know that they're gonna be able to count on you when we get to the other side of this. And so when you completely go away, there's, there's an unstated message that people can perceive. Now, what I think is important, and Scott, I don't know if you can address this, is that what's the right message right now? I, I think heavy direct selling is almost counterproductive right now, but there are other ways to provide guidance and messages that will resonate with people. So Scott, I don't know and then I do know that we have some other questions coming in here, but I just wanted to get that. So I don't know if you want to yeah. touch a little bit about what's the right messaging that people need to hear right now. Yeah. So good, really good point, Chuck. You know, you'll notice that in this presentation, we, we did not talk about reaching out directly to uh, potential customers. We really didn't talk about that. We talked more about connecting with people who are going to help build and amplify content, you know, for our business. So, you know, if we, if we wanted to talk about getting a direct customer connection, we'd maybe be talking a little bit more about LinkedIn or some of these different channels like, like Google ads. So, you know, today's presentation is really more about how can you shore up some of those personal connections with people on social media 
How can you create content that's going to be shareable and use that as in this time to have those conversations with people? And then when things start to normalize, you've got, you're, you're going to be ahead of everybody else. Some of those competitors that have maybe sat there and done nothing. Um, and so that, yes, you, what you said is exactly true. You know, let's not sell, let's build relationships. Let's use social media through, you know, and content building to do that. Um, and I think that's just a really important thing to, to keep in mind right now. So thank you, Chuck. Mm -hmm. Hey Scott, we've got a question um, from Crystalline on, do you have any advice for a new venue with limited content? I have started offering virtual tours, but I'm struggling to think of new content to keep people engaged. Chuck probably and, and Allie, all, all three of you, do you have any uh, suggestions for people figuring out what kind of content they can produce right now? Yeah, um, you know, I, I would say, you know, think about the things that people might ask you about, you know, the the types of events that they may be interested in holding, um, you know, go through your email list of people that are messaging you and, and asking questions. That's a great place to start with content. And, you know, if you're a new event, if you're a new, new event venue, you really haven't defined your brand quite yet. You know, there's a lot of imagery, there's text on your site, you know, you maybe have some brochures. The content that you put out can really help define what the brand um, is all about. Um, I work with a winery and you know they they are putting out recipes that pair with their wines well the types of recipes that they choose and the you know the style of cooking and and all that kind of thing helps you know identify more about what that brand is all about so think of things that you can do um, and things that you can talk about that are, are brand reinforcing topics Allie or Chuck? Go ahead Al. I was just going to jump in and say that in this instance, it's important to think about what kind of business you're trying to attract as well. So just for an example, um, if you were attracting wedding business, if you're a venue that uh, wants to you know, make revenue off of hosting weddings um, for the majority of events, it's important to um, you know, promote content that speaks to weddings, um, maybe speaks to catering at weddings or various topics. Um, and then also I find uh, searching hats to your brand or um, the type of events that you're hosting to be very important. And it also helps you engage with other clients. So if you're searching for hashtags, um, you can find other venues like yours or make established connections with some peers and maybe you guys can um, bounce some ideas off of each other or create a great network or connection as well. Awesome. And, and, and to just add to that, uh, while Scott was talking through this, I was thinking about one of my favorite Facebook pages from the past. I have to admit I have not gone recently and I cannot tell you if they still do this, but it, it, it makes me kind of make a parallel to how our, our venues, these venues, you people who are on here today could capitalize on this idea. It was Albemarle County, Virginia, which is the county that Charlottesville, Virginia is located in. It's a beautiful county, sits in the you know, Shenandoah Mountains of Virginia. And what they encourage their uh, Facebook followers to do is take a picture of them and their friends enjoying the day out in Albemarle County, and then they would post it and they would show that. So what I would consider right now, we all know we can't gather, but people have gathered in the past at your venue and have had a great time. So reach out to your past clients and say, we'd love to feature your past events showing how people have enjoyed or had a great experience at our venue. Send us a fun picture or a great picture from when you had an event in our venue and we're gonna go ahead and, and provide, you know, present that on our, on our Facebook page um, to show people how they could use our facility. So you know, get, get your former clients to help you engage to show how your venue comes alive because when it does come back alive, those are great, in a sense, they're almost a referral for you, right? So just a, a thought. So um, really quickly here, we have the results of poll four. Uh, and uh, Scott, uh, I don't know if you wanna talk about this one. This was one that you uh, prompted me to put in the polling results. It, it's asking people if they're following their competitors on social media. You can see that, uh, that some people are. Uh, some people are doing it kind of actively and others are doing it kind of stealthily. And some people are just not doing it or they haven't thought about doing it before. 
and um, and but I wanted to, to give you a chance to talk about why you think that's important. Yeah, so uh, you know, I think following your competitors, obviously, if you're a new venue or, or an established venue, you know, as a new venue, you're going to see what some of the conversations are, are happening, you know, like already, what some of your competitors' branding looks like, what kind of conversations they're bringing up. Um, you know, if you're a, an established venue, you're going to probably see some new competitors pop on that are going to be, um, that haven't been on your radar yet, you know, and sometimes there's uh, the people, you know, nipping at the heels that uh, get a little ahead, you know, because they're doing more on social media. So I do think it's important to watch your competitors. Um, you probably have two different competitor sets. You have uh, businesses that are direct competitors that are in your area that would potentially you know, be an, an option for an event planner between you and them. Uh, and then you have the, the non-direct competitors, the people that are still competing for conversation and voice within your region or within your, your uh, industry. So, you know, some of those might be bigger event venues or they may be uh, tourism associations or they may be, uh, you know, other directory sites out there, you know, so don't be afraid to follow them and see what they're talking about. Um, you know, if you're looking for a list of some great blog posts, you know, go to the Unique Venues blog. You know, there's a lot of topics there that you could, you know, repurpose for your own venue and, and start uh, building out a, a cache of, of content that way. So, you know, your competitors can be a great resource. And it looks like a lot of people are either following them either passively or uh, engaging with them a little bit. Um, so I would just challenge everybody on the on the webinar today to go follow a few competitors and you know, maybe even uh, become friends with them on social media. And, and there's some ways you guys can collaborate together um, during this time to have a little bit more resiliency and, and share some leads back and forth once things start um, getting going in a more normal way. Scott, quick question for you. Going back to the suggestion to do some pictures, having people share pictures. Now, I do know that the que this question is coming from a venue in Canada, so I don't know if you can answer this question from both the US and Canadian perspective, because there may be different policies behind it. But the question asked is, do we need a venue's permission to post the photo if you found it on their social media? So if they go and they go to one of their um, clients' social media, and they want to post an image of a group of people using their venue, can they do that without their permission? Or, you know, what are the rules of engagement for that? Yeah, so um, it's a little tricky. Obviously, there's the respect issue of, you know, making sure that you give someone a heads up um, or ask permission. You know, a lot of things that people might post uh, on, on Instagram or Facebook, and then they tag your event space you know, that stuff's public at that point, it's on Facebook, you know, so you could share their, their photo uh, if they've tagged your venue and, and share that in one of your own posts. You know, I think, um, I think that that's a really easy way and it allows there to be some trackability and some citation awareness there of where that photo is coming from. It's, it's from somebody who posted it. It's not necessarily your venue. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think asking for permission is probably a, a great thing to do. Um, or at least giving people a heads up. Hey, we, we saw your post. We'd love to share it. You know, just wanted to give you a heads up. A simple message like that can can go a long way with people. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers that question. I, think I also just, can I add something real quick is that um, I'll, I would say 99% of the event photographers that we've worked with to share their images require permission. Um, so say if it is a wedding, a lot of the wedding photographers do require permission to post their content. And sometimes they will require that they have a watermark on their images. Um, but as long as you get permission from them and maybe tag them in the post as well, um, they're very flexible about removing the watermark. So I just wanted to add that in as well. Yeah, that's great. And, and I'll take that even a step further. You know, that's, that's another relationship you can build with someone. So, you know, that just that opening up of recognizing that they have a great piece of content, a great photo, um, you'd love to use it. You know, if, if you include that in a blog post and then share that on social media, there's a pretty good chance they're going to also share that on their social media. Um, people love to be highlighted and, and kind of brought, brought to the forefront. So, um, you know, that, that's a, don't, don't shy away from seeing watermarks or seeing, you know, rights reserved and that kind of thing. A lot of people will be willing to, you know, share that and let you share that if it's in both of your interests. 
Well, hey, I want to especially thank Scott today for his uh, time and his expertise in bringing this uh, very important subject to our membership and all those others who participated out there. Again, it's really great to see planners and industry experts and media personnel and all joining in on what's going on here as we continue to rally around uh, the hospitality and meetings and events industry during this time. Um, I've put up a slide here really quickly just to show you we, we are continuing with our educational blitz, lots of different ways in which you can get involved. We're super excited tomorrow. Uh, we have an industry expert panel uh, with uh, four different representatives uh, that will speak into a different uh, part of the, in, the meetings and, and events industry. Uh, that kicks off at 2 p.m. Eastern and uh, we were at 400 and some registrations earlier today. So uh, our webinar limit is 500 at this point. So if you haven't registered yet, you may want to do so and make sure you get on a little early tomorrow. If you wanna, we, we would hate to see someone get shut out, uh, but we are capped off at 500, which are numbers we never thought we'd talk about in a million years. So it's great to see the response. Uh, we have a wellness workshop coming up next week with Dr. Michael Brown. Uh, that will help people kind of just gauge their own emotional well-being and keep up their spirits uh, during what's going on right now. The next member group therapy is on April 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, it's just kind of a roundtable format where people can ask questions and get them answered not just by us but really by their peers so that you can connect with one another. Uh, the next preparing for the rebound session data mining is on April 9th. Uh, that, that one is not listed for registration on our resources page, uh, but BLAST will be going out to members around that one. If you are a non-member or someone that would like to do it, just send me an email, joel at uniquevenues.com, and we'll make sure that we can get you into that. And then finally, there's a NACUS webinar right now. It is now on a wait list. Um, it is full, but uh, if you want to put yourself on the wait list, just in case some people cancel out or drop out, then uh, please feel free to do that. That will be Chuck and I talking about life after COVID-19. And we have more in the works. You can see them all on our resources page, which is listed at the, the bottom of the screen here. And uh, we're probably in the next few days gonna be coming up with what we'll do in late April and early May, as it looks like things are going to continue. And we wanna keep providing uh, really great content to all of you as we go throughout it. So thank you very much for your time today. Uh, Chuck, you've got something? I just wanna end by saying thank you so much. I've been seeing really nice messages where people are saying, it's so nice to see you, Chuck. I haven't seen you in a long time. It's great to, to have everybody on here. I also wanna do a shout out. We have some representatives from some of our um, association partners on here. You know, when we set out to do all of these webinars and we made a decision to make them available beyond our own membership, um, we reached out to a lot of associations. And um, I just wanna, I wanna give hats off to uh, the International Association of Conference Centers, IAC. Uh, whose worldwide uh, uh, association president joined us today, Sean Anderson, thank you for being with us. Um, KUKOA, which is the Canadian uh, University and College Conference Officers Association, they blocked arms with us on this, as well as NACUS, as you can see, sharing resources. Um, you know, we, we are open to working with any organization and association because our firm belief is that we're stronger together through all of this. You know, we all have to lock arms and get through this together. So uh, we're here for you. We'll stay here for you. And uh, we're looking forward to all of these next. And believe me, we're already working on the next big set of uh, next big set of programs. We're, we're, no rest. So. Excellent. Well, again, thank you everyone for your time today. And uh, we will uh, share the slides and the poll results with those that uh, registered and provided an email and registration, provided that it's valid. And you will be able to catch a re the recording of this if you missed part of it or if you have people on your team you want to share it with. Uh, it'll be up within 24 hours and uh, you'll see it on the resources page. You'll see it on our YouTube channel. You'll see it in the learning lab for, for those members off the member dashboard. So again, have a great rest of the day and we'll see you on a future webinar. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye.